This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pauline Shekmakjian, your host for We Like the 1%. We Like the 1% is a show that focuses on individuals and entrepreneurs. And what better example of an individual than a truly talented artist? My guest today is one such artist. He is Marcus Hanale Marzan. And Marcus is a fiber artist and a cultural advisor at the Brit Bishop Museum. Not the British Museum, the Bishop <laughs> Museum here in Honolulu. Good morning, Marcus. Good morning, aloha. Aloha, thank you for being here this morning. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Yes, and now a fiber artist is quite specialized, isn't it? It, it can be, definitely. And um, it's, a, it's quite a unique specialism in the uh, world of fine and decorative arts. And what we mean by a fiber artist isn't like Chris Ophelia, who is an <laughs> artist known for putting glitter and elephant dung and splattering it all over canvas, isn't it? No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Something no. totally different. <laughs> different. <laughs> so what do we mean by fiber artists uh -huh. and fiber art, Marcus? So the fiber arts are, are all of the art forms that incorporate natural materials um, in as the base material um, and then um, through different processes. So um, basket making, plating, um, loom weaving, knot work um, are all considered fiber, te uh, fiber arts um, because of the, the material uh, that um, they're all made from. Brilliant. And have you always engaged with fiber <coughs> arts and fiber artwork, or did you start off more traditionally? For example, uh, I'm not a professional artist like you, but I had a painting scholarship in fine art when I was at university. So we would do watercolor, oil, things like that, that were traditional, uh, that formed the fundamental basis for your practice later on. Yes. So did you start off in that traditional education, or uh, did you always just go straight to fiber art? I think in my formal education, <coughs> I was pretty much um, committed to the fiber arts from the beginning, but in the beginning when I was a young boy, I loved to draw, I loved to make, make things out of mud and clay and different kinds of things like that. Uh, and then I got um, more specialized classes and experience um, as I um, grew up and became a teenager and went to college. Um, and that's where I actually committed to the fiber arts. And all of your training is Hawaii based, Hawaiian based? So, um, so when I first started taking classes when I was a teenager, it was ba Hawaiian um, material based. Uh -huh. So the lauhalo weaving and yes. some different basketry and net, uh, net making and different things like that. And when I went to the university and started taking the courses there, um, I was introduced to the world, the world fiber arts, um, loom weaving and all the other textile um, arts as well. So I think um, all of those, plus the, the background that I gained um, through my formative years mm -hmm. as a teenager, I think I really um, was drawn to the Pacific arts. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. And I first learned about you uh, at the first ever Honolulu Biennial last year. Yes. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet you. And what happened was there were artworks scattered about everywhere uh, in that general hub area. and. I went through the main gallery, mm -hmm. and there were some very clever things on display. All the artists had talent, obviously. And uh, we started with the boats uh, yes. that had all the different <laughs> elements. Every boat was different. Uh, everybody was on a different voyage. And when I came upon your section in the gallery, I noticed there was a very peaceful and tranquil atmosphere around your work. And I really liked the ambience that you had created with your work. And I think the studio is going to show some of the work from the Honolulu Biennial that I'm referring to okay. as we discuss these kind of kimono-like pieces that you had on display. So what was your uh, influence to create these kimono-like pieces, so, these exhibits? Yeah, so when I was first um, invited to participate in the Biennial, I was asked, um, what kind of thing I would create for it, what kind of installation piece I would create for the space. And I really wanted to make something um, based, uh, Hawaii based. So um, with all of my experience and background in Hawaiian culture and the material um, culture of Hawaii, I really wanted to focus in on um, the traditional deities of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so in, in Hawaiian um, culture and, and history, the deities um, lived in all aspects of, of life in the land, in the sea, in the sky, within people, within mm -hmm. everything. 
so to to really manifest them in in four in the four pieces that I presented in the biennial um, was my way to really connect the place and sh and showcase um, Hawaii um, in a in a very um, abstract contextual way, um, incorporating the colors and the plant materials and the different um, techniques associated with the different um, god forms of Hawaii. And the number four is significant. You didn't just pick that randomly four because I've, I've been to the Bishop Museum. Yeah, that is correct. And there is a section on the Hawaiian cosmology yes. which states that four, the four original gods, yes. are very important to the Hawaiians. Yes. And uh, it's interesting here in Hawaii because um, I do a lot with Japan. Yes. And in Japan and China, four is the unluckiest number because yes. it's associated with the same sound as death. Yes. But in Hawaii, it's the luckiest number and four times four is the luckiest because it's four times for gods. Correct. Yes. Yes. So in the in the uh, famous creation chant, the Kumulipo, there's 16 wa or 16 mm -hmm. time periods where all of life is created, um, in different in, um, throughout these 16 phases of, of of creation, and and the gods, of course, um, are are um, enumerated in multiples of four. So. 440, 400, 40, 400,000 um, gods. And so um, there's the, the varying degrees in which the gods um, appear and manifest in our world. And uh, the one that caught my eye was the blue. Uh, the very blue indigo-like yes. uh, kimono. Mm -hmm. And I'm referring to them as kimono, maybe you have mm -hmm. a different word for them, but it struck me uh, as very Japanese. Yes, uh, for that yes. particular one, in. Um, uh, I would say it did have a very Japanese feel mm -hmm. to it, you know, because I, I'm also part but Japanese yeah. in ancestry. Um, I really wanted to incorporate my own personal um, um, aesthetic into these pieces, not just focusing in on uh, Hawaiian materials per se and, and how they're presented, but really incorporating myself into it and, and my understanding of the, of the world that, um, of Hawaii and, and the people and the, and the culture. So. Um, that particular, um, that particular Akua or mm -hmm. the um, Akua. Akua, the god um, represented there was of Kanaloa. Kanaloa yes. is the god of the sea, yes. the god of the sea, the god of purification, um, and blue is, of course, being one of his primary colors associated with him. Um, and I think um, because of my training in from the university and all of the, the other. Um, um, experiences that I've had in my um, travels around and, and experience in different cultural practices and traditional um, techniques, indigo was um, something that I, I really uh, gravitated to and I really wanted to incorporate that into that particular yeah. um, you must area. be the Japanese in you, that because that is a very popular color in Japan yes. to use for textiles. Aizome, yes. yes, it's a it's a specific training they have to go through for the indigo dyeing. Yes, and uh, so the blue one is Kanaloa. Kanaloa. And how about the other ones? Can you identify them by color? Yes. So there's so a signal. The, so in in the the installation, I had banners that also corresponded to the the four. Um, A'ahu, or the, gar the garment um, pedestal pieces. Um, so there was red, red banners uh, corresponding to the red piece, yellow, white, and black, and then the blue. So uh, white and black are actually the colors most associated with the god Lono. Mm -hmm. The god Lono is the god of the harvest, the, the god of peace and prosperity. And, and Captain Cook. <laughs> <laughs> they well, thought he was Captain yes, Cook. Yes, of course. Well, <laughs> I think because he came during the time yes, of Lono, they, yes. they had those associations already on their mind, and they saw his white sails, the big white billowing mm -hmm. banners on his mm -hmm. on his ship, and they they made those the connections. Floating the floating island, yes. of course, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and the other two, the red piece uh, associated with the god Ku, the god mm -hmm. of, of warfare. masculinity, yes. warfare, governance. And then the yellow is the god um, of Kane, mm -hmm. the god of life and creation. So all together, they create the whole world and, and all the manifestations in, in between. Lovely. And I just wanted, you're one of the few artists I've actually spoken to uh, who participated in the Honolulu Biennial last yeah. year. Uh, so are you going to participate in the next one next year? Um, I haven't been formally asked, but I have been asked to be a part of their advisory um, council to assist right. them in in trying to find um, different approaches in, in melding together the contemporary artists of Hawaii with the with the international artists. 
And what were your impressions of the biennial? It's interesting to see an artist's perspective of the works of the other artists there. Yeah, Did I you have a favorite artist? You wouldn't say yourself. <laughs> 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 no, I think, you know, because um, the, the installation process at the Hub um, really opened um, my eyes to seeing how different pieces were in installed, um, how the peop different people worked on creating their pieces. I saw some people work up to the last minute creating mm -hmm. um, certain aspects of their piece. Some people um, built their, their installations very quickly and, and mm -hmm. got them finished very um, um, on time. So I think we ha with all of the, the artists present, I think it really created a, a nice community of conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I really um, took out of this, the, um, the, the greatest um, enjoyment that I had in was that that interaction with all the artists and, and really Art, enjoying. Artists are wonderful fun, aren't they? Yes, they are. They're a lot of fun. I think people don't realize yeah. the, the interactions that happen behind the scenes and um, and all of those things. And yeah, it was really enjoyable to, to spend if, time with if them. If my recollection is correct, you were the only fiber artist there, weren't you? Uh, um, there was nobody else making these kind of displays no, that uh, yeah. were related to fashion in some yes, way. Yes, I was. Yes. I, I would say, that, yeah, in that in regard, I was the only one. Yes, that's uh, brilliant. So you are unique <laughs> in that <laughs> respect. So uh, mm. the dates for the next biennial have been selected as well as the title. So it's called An Open Boat. Yes. And it will take place next year because it is a biennial. And it's going to be the 8th of March mm -hmm. to the 5th of May, 2019. So um, you're going to be on the advisory board, which is very exciting. And do you have any other plans between now and then, or perhaps in the future, for any other exhibitions of your own work here in Hawaii or elsewhere? Um, well, I have been asked, um, because of my exposure from the biennial and other exhibitions that I've had since, um, to do a couple of commissions here and there throughout Hawaii. So I've, I'm, I'm working on a couple of small commissions here um, locally for uh, for a, ho uh, a, ho a hotel, oh, um, St. Andrew's Cathedral, oh, and, um, uh, yeah, so a couple of um, really exciting projects for me I'm, I'm interested in doing. Is most of your artwork related to Hawaiian cosmology, or do you touch upon other subjects in your fiber artwork? I think um, because of the material and the techniques, the materials and the techniques that I use are primarily Hawaii based. Mm -hmm. um, they already have that inherent connection to Hawaii. Um, but I really do think that um, my works actually talk more broad um, um, concepts mm -hmm. of, of um, connections, relationships with nature and, and the world. So it's not um, necessarily just of, of Hawaii. And you have quite an extensive experience with other uh, areas in the Asia Pacific region. You've done collaboration with other artists in other locations. Can yes. you list some of those? So I have traveled uh, um, extensively across the Pacific um, to um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, to Fiji, Tahiti, um, Samoa, um, Solomon Islands, Palau. So and interacted with a lot of the cultural groups and communities there. So. Um, it's it's an always an amazing opportunity to connect with the indigenous peoples of different places and really understand have a conversation with them because um, I think when I first started to travel around the Pacific I realized that the stories and this and the issues that they were dealing with in those different places were the same issues that were being um, dealt with here in Hawaii and it really focused it back on me as like wow you know these people are it, facing the exact same issues as, as, as I am back home. And it really made me think, wow, they're teaching me how to really connect to Hawaii, you know, even though I'm not actually part of them in Hawaii at the time when they were, when that um, inspiration came. And in terms of your own inspiration, do you have favorite artists, either dead or alive, that you can mention? Do you have influences? Actually, the most inspiring artists are the ancestral pieces that exist um, in museums and family collections. Um, they, to me, are, are those ancestral kupuna, or the yes. elders, yes. that, mm -hmm. that um, don't physically have a voice to, to teach and, and pass that knowledge on. But if you're able to observe them in, in a very um, 
conscious way, mm -hmm. they will speak to you. And they do speak to me um, quite often. So I think those are the, the most um, inspiring teachers, uh, those pieces that exist, that have such a rich story that um, don't um, get expressed just from the visual presentation, but they have so many things if you actually are aware of how, how, how they really can tell, um, teach. Okay, brilliant, Marcus. Yeah. Well, we're just going to take a very quick break, and we'll be right back after this quick break. All right. Thank you. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. We're going to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. So try a little more, more than every more, let's do what we can. Thank you. I said I could play, so any chance to play at all, you know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, that's how we do it. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch, and every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to We Like the 1%. We're speaking with Marcus Hanale Marzan. And Marcus, uh, what about your role at the Bishop Museum? You're as cultural advisor cultural there. Advisor. Explain what that means. And so, um, well, I've been at the Bishop Museum for, for 15 years now, mm. and I've served in different capacities, currently as, as cultural advisor. Um, but I actually provide cultural ad advice and guidance to all levels of management um, and the organization itself, and, and assist in cultural protocols and any kind of um, community engagement issues that require um, you know, that cultural lens to be so if um, people need advice, if they're advice if anthropological regard, research. Regarding yeah, cultural matters, um, um, you know, actual um, ceremonial protocols that, uh, that occur you know, in communities, um, uh, like for instance, the, the honoring of Princess Powahi on her birthday, mm -hmm. or, or Charles Reed Bishop on his, on his birthday, different kinds of things like that, where, where we want to honor, honor different things um, and, and commemorate different events. Mm -hmm. Um, we, uh, um, I'm asked to assist in, in providing um, um, my expertise in those areas, um, as well as in cultural content, in building of ex exhibitions and pro cultural programming. And you must be quite busy this year because there are a lot of things related to various anniversaries related to the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom, that, things like yes. things of this nature. Yes. <laughs> Opening day is going to be very interesting in the <laughs> legislature next week, probably. <laughs> so um, we're just showing uh, the viewers who can see your beautiful artwork at the Honolulu Biennial, the examples of what you were talking about in reference to the color and the Hawaiian gods. Yeah. So everybody can identify which god oh, with which kimono or a fiber art piece that you can see there. Mm. And while these are being shown, let's talk about what's happening at the Bishop Museum at the moment. So currently we have on um, exhibition an exhibit on navigation. Holo Moana is, its, is the title. Uh, and um, it does have a strong focus on, on the Hokulea's journey around the world, the Malama Honua uh, voyage. Because Hokulea is back now. Hokulea okay. is back yeah. in Hawaii and, and traveling around the islands and connecting with the community again. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's our, that's our um, current exhibition at the moment, of course, alongside you know, our permanent galleries of Hawaiian and Pacific Halls. And, and we do encourage, even though you're a local and you've been to uh, the Bishop Museum before, maybe as a child on a school visit, 
uh, I'm only here two or three months every year, and I go to the Bishop Museum every year. And uh, we were talking about this earlier, where you did recently have, in the past couple of years or so, an exhibition on uh, wearable arts. So yes. This is a, a New Zealand concept. It's a Kiwi invention, originally from Nelson in the South Island, Correct. which the Wellingtonians took and brought it to the capital. Uh, and the Nelsonians weren't too happy about that. But it's called WOW, the World of Wearable Art. And uh, that was on display in the Bishop Museum, I believe, a couple of years yes, ago. Yes, it was. So, but there were quite distinctive Hawaiian-inspired pieces that I didn't see in New Zealand when I first saw the show there. Mm -hmm. I was on a lecture tour in 2014. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I, I encountered WOW. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had this magnificent piece in the Bishop Museum exhibition that was made entirely out of koa wood. Koa wood, yes. So uh, were you involved in that exhibition? Um, no, so, so WOW actually mm -hmm. had a traveling exhibition um, and, and offered it to the Bishop Museum. And we, we jumped on it, and we felt that it would make a beautiful um, complement to our, our, our permanent galleries. And it really did do uh, a successful uh, run during its time in Hawaii. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned the exhibition on the Hokulea. Uh, what other things are going on? Because there's one on animation at the moment, one on and animation. one on dinosaurs that are coming up. Uh, one on yeah. dinosaurs coming up later on this year. Uh, we also have in the works an exhibition um, um, focusing on Rapa Nui. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be presenting right. um, our um, the majority of our um, collections connected to Rapa Nui in this in this particular exhibition. Um, have you been to Easter Island? I have not. Oh. That's I have. I, that's it's a maximum two days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny place, but it's worth it to see the moai there. Yes. And uh, I just wanted to ask you in the moments that we have left in the show, uh, it's an interesting subject because I'm interested in uh, futurism. Mm -hmm. And I went to a presentation that was technologically inclined. They were talking about all sorts of futuristic technology. This is the concept like universal basic income. What are we going to do when automation, AI, machine learning, and robotics take over most jobs? Uh, some people don't believe robots are going to take over all jobs. I think certain professions are quite safe, mm -hmm. such as health-related medical professions. And probably also the creative industries, mm -hmm. artists, things that because a robot can't be creative. Yeah. Not yet, <laughs> not, un unless you believe in that idea that may might attain consciousness yes. and all this sort of thing and replicate human thought. But um, still, there's this creative spark that I think is unique to the humans. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the presentations I attended, the gentleman said, we're going to have all this free time. Everybody's going to have free time to do arts. <laughs> and uh, I. I listen to people who are up and coming fashion designers, sometimes because they're in their 20s, they're still making a name for themselves. They supplement their income by teaching at fashion colleges mm -hmm. or uh, universities uh, with fine arts, uh, decorative arts programs. And they tell me in private dinner parties that it's amazing to them how untalented people really are. And you have to be realistic and assume that these universities or colleges, a lot of them, they're businesses. Mm -hmm. So they have to have an intake of students to keep going. And whether the person has talent or not, <laughs> it doesn't really matter because they, want, uh, they need the students to survive. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, in the future, maybe in 10 years' time when all these advances uh, come to fruition, Will people do, be doing more arts? And if so, are they going to be bad art? <laughs> Is it going to be bad art in production? <laughs> well, I would hope I would hope people would take take up um, um, cr being creative with their with their free time. Um, with my experience, anyway, I'm working with school school age children, even um, college and adult um, students. A lot of them that do not have any kind of connection to to the outdoors mm -hmm. really have a hard time making things. Mm. So I've noticed a lot of people that, that go fishing mm. or you know farm or garden or things like that that actually use their hands and mm -hmm. do something with their hands actually have a lot easier time coming up and being more creative with, um, with the different pieces that I was able to, sh um, to demonstrate and, and teach them um, versus the people that were divorced from the land, you know, very um, um, urban living, you know, uh, mm. very few connections to to uh, the natural environment. Really had a hard time. I'm um, yeah. really well, connecting. It's so. interesting you mentioned that, Marcus, because one of my neighbors mentioned that I don't know how accurate this is, but apparently 
because a lot of children are on the screen all the time, when they go outdoors, because they're spending more time indoors and having things like screen sickness, they're on the computer constantly or on the smartphone, uh, that their eyes actually don't focus properly. That's what I've heard so as well. So it's not necessarily a lack of creativity, it's that they're being harmed mm -hmm. by this screen usage. Mm -hmm. So it, is it better that they spend, the parents try to put them outside more? I, I think so yes. because, uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of um, Hawaiian charter schools mm -hmm. which have a very um, different way of approaching their, their teaching of their students and really engaging them into um, land-based and out community-based projects. So um, the, the students that have actually gone and um, weeded a taro patch mm -hmm. or cleaned a fish pond and things, really have the dexterity, their fingers are actually more dex, um, um, nimble to, mm -hmm. to do some of those really intricate um, um, fine um, techniques like weaving and, and making of nets and things like that. So because when a master artist such as yourself, you create something, it looks very simple to do, it but it does. isn't. You no, have to have a lot of manual coordination I think and that's, dexterity. And that's what a, a yeah. lot of people don't realize, that it, mm -hmm. it looks very easy to create because it doesn't look, uh, it doesn't have a lot of complicated parts to it mm -hmm. or something. But once people start trying the technique and oh. putting the materials it's together, very difficult. they yeah. really, really realize that it's a lot more work than they thought it was. Yeah. And what is your opinion of the level or quality of art education in Hawaii? Is it something that kind of gets left behind like I, in other jurisdictions? I, I think at the moment, yes. I think it's... It's kind of put on the bottom of the list of everything. And I, yeah. I always keep telling people arts and culture is what makes us human. It's the core of and humanity. And it's kind of the, mo yes, the least yeah. important thing. And everybody focuses on STEM, yeah. uh, which is import equally it important. Is important but but like you said, the humanity is is based in cultural practices, beliefs, and family, and the connections like that. So to have that, um, you know, pushed off the the plate of education uh, program and teaching, um, is I think uh, a detriment to the children. And how do you think that can be improved upon? Improved upon here in Hawaii, uh, because you do on occasion there are competitions such as the Hawaii State. Art Museum, they do do things that are open to the public to participate in. Yeah. Uh, but do you think we could do more uh, besides the Honolulu Biennial, which I think is a fantastic idea, mm -hmm. and uh, congratulations to the co-founders mm -hmm. for doing that, because yeah. it is a lot of work to put on an event like it that. It is, definitely. Um, I think for me personally, the, the incorporation of more land-based um, teaching and learning throughout the the, you know the DOE system is actually um, more likely to assist in the in the um, education of the students because again like I mentioned for the for all of the charter schools and the immersion school students that have been raised with this kind of um, approach of teach of learning they really do think differently mm -hmm. and see the world differently and I think if we were able to even um, introduce that kind of engage engagement with um, with out the outdoors or even um, just understanding with uh, for for the broader community of students it would make a big difference and is the focus primarily on Hawaiian art itself or are there foreign elements like do they teach European art as well or is it about 50 50 mm -hmm. I think it's a combination yeah mm -hmm. definitely a combination um, of course you know the the Hawaiian arts definitely come in quite um, easily because of the particular programs that are offered you know if you're going out to a fish pond you want to learn how to make a fish trap or a fish hook or something like that. Um, but I think definitely the, the incorporation of drawing and painting um, is incorporated in, into their work, into their curriculum as well. And do you have a foreign artists come and visit here and spend time to learn about Hawaiian art? Is there, are there programs like that people can look up? Um, I don't think there are any formal programs like that. There have been a lot, I, because of the networks that I've created over the years, I've already built um, um, relationships with other in institutions and community groups, and they have come to Hawaii, and we've been created our own um, own cultural experiences and engagements like that. Brilliant, Marcus. And uh, is there a website people can go on to learn more about your artwork or uh, anything like that? I have that? a website, marcusmarzan.com, and it has uh, a little bit of my, my own background history as well as some pictures and, and information on how to contact me. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being my guest this morning, Marcus. Thank you Marcus. so much, Pauline. Thank yeah, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And I'll see you next week for We Like the 1% on thir at Thursdays at 11 a.m. Thank Aloha. you. Bye.